Aloha. Aloha. It's great to see everybody. Thank you so much for coming out today. And thank you, Ed, for your kind introduction and for inviting me here to join you today to talk about some very serious issues that we face in this country and that we face as a generation. We gather here today during a time of crisis. This is both a crisis, uh, instability and divisiveness that we experience here at home, as well as crisis, instability and divisions abroad in our foreign policy. But here at home, unfortunately, we are in a place where as we look at our everyday lives and we look at how disconnected leaders in Washington are from the experiences and the challenges that, that people in this country face, we see how unfortunate it is that the vision that our founders had for us in this country of a government that is truly of the people, by the people, and most importantly for the people, is lost. The reality that we see too often on issue after issue after issue is that we really have a government that is of the powerful, by the powerful, and for the powerful, or of the corporate special interests, by the special interests, and for the special interests. And so what is the result? The result is we the people get left behind. We the people end up suffering as a result of these policies that are made, these laws that are passed that serve those very few, but often have a detrimental impact on the rest of us. And so what is at the heart of this crisis that we face is that we are being divided as a country. We are being torn apart by self-serving politicians and those greedy corporations that seek to profit on the backs of the American people who seek to gain or further their own interests by dividing us, by pitting us one against the other, whether it be based on our political party or how we worship or the color of our skin or where we come from or who we love. This is a travesty and it undermines that vision that our founders had for us. It undermines these values that are at the heart of our country, these values that speak to the concerns, really, that are shared by people across this country. Concerns about health care. Concerns about the fact that we have sick people in this country who are not able to get the care they need because they don't have enough money in their bank account. Concerns about crumbling infrastructure that threatens our safety and well-being concerns about our environment, the threat of climate change, the fact that we have so many people in this country who are being poisoned by the water that they drink. There are people in Flint, Michigan, who even as they were in the headlines a little while ago, they're no longer in the headlines, but people in Flint are still not able to shower in their own homes. Otherwise, They'll be sick. Concerns about the cost of higher education and a generation of people who will be burdened and saddled with student debt loans. Concerns about a dwindling middle class and a growing divide between the haves and the have-nots. Concerns about the need for urgent immigration reform, criminal justice reform. As I travel the country and I visit people in different communities, people from all ends of the political spectrum, these are the concerns that I'm hearing from them about. But too often their voices are not heard in Washington. Too often we see those needs are not addressed once again, as I said, because their interests are not at the forefront of those who are making decisions in this country about how our limited resources are being used. We have limited resources, and we have great needs. But unfortunately, we continue to see self-serving politicians who waste those resources and ignore our needs. So we could speak for a long time about every one of those concerns that I raised, 
And these are issues that we need to focus on solving as a country. But there is one issue that's central to the rest. There is one issue that's central to our ability to address those needs, and that issue is the cost of war. The ongoing regime change wars, this new Cold War we're in, and nuclear arms race. Now, I'm running for president to end our long-standing policy of overthrowing one foreign government after another, to work to end this new Cold War and nuclear arms race, and redirect the trillions of dollars that are being taken out of our pockets to pay for these wars and weapons, and instead keep those dollars in our pockets, and make sure that we are using the limited resources that we have to meet the needs of our people to meet the needs of our communities. Because the reality is that as long as we are wasting trillions of dollars preparing for a nuclear war, whether it be with a country like Russia or China, as long as we continue waging one regime change war after another, we will not be able to provide health care for all. We will not have the resources we need to make sure our kids are getting a good education. We will not have the resources we need to make the kinds of bold investments in green renewable energy that we need to make. We will not have the resources that we need to protect our environment, to protect our air, to protect our water, to invest in our middle class. So that's the decision that's before us. It's before every single one of us as voters in this country. We need to decide whether we want to continue as a country to be the world's police, intervening in one foreign country after another, toppling one dictator after another, or focus on taking care of our people and rebuilding our own communities. We cannot afford to do both. We cannot afford to do both. So as we, as we talk about the cost of war, there are many different costs that we have to consider. As a soldier, I've served in the Army National Guard for 16 years. I've deployed twice to the Middle East, and I've seen firsthand the high human cost of war. During that first deployment to Iraq in 2005, we were based in a camp that was about 40 miles north of Baghdad. Uh, at a, at a time where it was the height of the Iraq war, there was a lot of casualties. And I served in that medical unit for our brigade combat team that had nearly 3,000 soldiers from Hawaii and across the Pacific. And the very first thing that I did every single day, the very first thing that I was tasked with every single day was to go through a list of names of every single American casualty that had occurred in the previous 24 hours. And I had to go through that list looking to see if there were any of those soldiers from our brigade who were, who were there, who were injured, or who were hurt, to make sure that they were either getting the care in country that they needed or to get them evacuated as quickly as possible, make sure that they got the care they needed until they finally made their way home. It was heart-wrenching every single day to see those names of my brothers and sisters in uniform and to know behind every single one of those names were loved ones, family members, husbands, wives, children, parents, brothers and sisters back home, stressed and anxious and worried for their safety. In every one of those names were service members who would eventually come home with wounds both visible and invisible. Wounds and scars that would stay with them for many years to come. What to speak of those who never made that trip home. Friends of ours who were killed in combat Friends of ours who, our final goodbye, our sudden final goodbye, consisted of saluting their empty boots and their rifle and empty helmet. 
people who were there with us one day and gone the next. This cost of war is paid for by these men and women. It is paid for by our families. Families who stay home, seeing their loved one deploy, often multiple times, who see the stress that that's caused as our troops are spread thin. Just a few weeks ago, the first week of April, I said goodbye in Hawaii to a couple hundred Hawaii National Guard soldiers who were from the unit that I deployed with during my second deployment about 10 years ago. This time they're off to Afghanistan. And there were a number of them who were younger soldiers who'd never been deployed before, but there were a lot who had, who I served with, who I deployed with, who had deployed now three or four or five times in the Army National Guard. And as I talked with them, they I asked, how's your family doing? How are your kids doing? And they talked about the hardship, the great hardship that's placed on their family. A friend of mine talked about his 15-year-old daughter who said, Daddy, who's going to teach me how to drive? When I turn 16, I can get my learner's permit. Who's going to teach me how to drive? And for him, it broke his heart that he would have to go away. He's five kids, the youngest is three years old. How much of his life he'd be missing. And they're going off to serve in a war in Afghanistan that is continuing now in its 18th year. Already over 2,300 Americans killed, over 20,000 Americans wounded, and for what? For what? We've spent over a trillion dollars in Afghanistan alone. We continue to spend $4 billion in Afghanistan, dollars that are coming out of our pockets every single month. $4 billion a month. We've seen countless lives lost, both American lives and Afghan lives, only to find ourselves in a place where we are no closer to so-called victory than we were 18 years ago in a place where only the Afghan people can determine their future. So I've seen that high human cost of war through my service in the military, and as one of the first female combat veterans ever elected to Congress, serving over six years on the Armed Services and Foreign Affairs Committees, I have seen our foreign policy establishment and the military industrial complex in action and seen the direct effects of our ongoing destructive policies that they continue to push. The impact on the people in the countries where we wage regime change wars. The increased death and destruction and suffering that occurs as a result. The homes and the infrastructure that's destroyed. We see the cost in our resources. It's something that people don't often realize that Yes, it's our troops and our veterans who pay the price for war in this country, but it is actually every single one of us through the trillions of dollars that are taken out of our pockets. Have you ever wondered how it's possible that this country, the wealthiest country in the world, can't afford to maintain our roads and bridges? Have you ever wondered how it's possible that this country can't afford to make sure every American has clean water to drink? How is it possible that this country cannot provide health care for its people? We look to the cost of war and how since 9-11 alone we have spent anywhere from six to eight trillion dollars on regime change wars, which doesn't even include what we know we will continue to spend in taking care of those who served in these wars, taking care of our veterans, not for the first year they're back or not their first initial hospital stay, but for generations. In my congressional office in Hawaii, we do constituent services where people call and say, hey, I need help with a federal agency, any federal agency. Can you guess the number one agency people call and request help with? Anybody? It's the VA by three or four times. 
And these are not primarily post 9-11 veterans, it's Vietnam veterans, people who are still fighting the bureaucracy just to get the basic care and benefits they've earned. Right now, the US leads the world in military spending, accounting for about one third of all money spent globally on military activities. And for this next fiscal year, the Trump administration has submitted its budget to Congress with a request of about $720 billion in military spending with cuts across the rest of the federal budget. $720 billion, which is almost twice what the rest of the world spends altogether. So that's the cost on our resources. There's a cost that undermines our national security. We've seen how these regime change wars have created the greatest refugee and immigration crisis since the Second World War across Europe, created a rift between Eastern and Western European countries. These regime change wars have exacerbated the problem of nuclear proliferation and stood in the way of our abilities to do things like denuclearize the Korean Peninsula. The leader of North Korea has, has cited, look at what the United States did with Libya. So you wonder why is it that we have not yet been able to make a deal to denuclearize North Korea? They look to Libya, where the United States made a, a deal with Gaddafi at that time, saying if you give up your nuclear weapons program, we won't come after you. So he did. And what happened next? The United States went after him and toppled Gaddafi. So the leader of North Korea points to that example saying, they have developed nuclear weapons as their deterrent against regime change. So as this administration continues to wage more regime change wars and regime change efforts, it is directly undermining our ability to make this agreement with North Korea to denuclearize. Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda is stronger than ever before today. They presently are in control of an entire city of Idlib in Syria. Our regime change war in Syria is continuing and leaders in our country today are preparing us for new regime change wars against Iran, in Venezuela, in Cuba, Nicaragua. This cost of these regime change wars is not a thing of the past. This is happening now. As we hear these war drums being beat, beaten to go to war with Iran, we have to take into account the reality that going to war with Iran, a regime change war in Iran, will prove far more costly than anything we saw in Iraq. We hear quotes from National Security Council Director John Bolton, Secretary Pompeo, who talk openly about how the United States is ready to take on Russia, China, and Iran. Bolton asking leaders in the Pentagon for military war plans against Iran. They're undermining our national security. They're putting us in a greater risk and danger of conflict with especially high stakes as we look at the prospects of conflict with nuclear armed countries like Russia and China increasing. And I can say this as a soldier, that it's tragic that the primary mission of our military is to protect the American people. And yet our leaders have not only failed our country, they have failed our troops by continuing to send them on reckless counterproductive regime change missions around the world, spending trillions on those regime change wars, undermining our military's readiness, stretching our troops very thin, placing great stress on our military families and undermining our national security. These costs are great, but the most serious and potentially costly threat to our country and to our people and to our planet is this new Cold War and nuclear arms race. Unfortunately, you're not hearing about this if you turn on the news. You're not reading about this in the headlines. Leaders in Washington and the media are completely ignoring this most important of issues that we face. And there will be many costs to this new Cold War and arms race the most serious of which that it poses an existential threat 
to all of us, to our country, and to our planet. This is an issue that no other presidential candidate is discussing, this issue of the threat of nuclear war. So not only will this new Cold War and arms race cost us trillions of dollars, it'll undermine our democracy and civil liberties in the way that the previous Cold War did. We have to remember that the first casualty of war is often our constitutional rights, our civil liberties and privacy. We saw how in the previous Cold War, suspicion and government surveillance of Americans increased. We remember the House Committee on Un-American Activities. We got a glimpse of how our society changed when we look back to that McCarthy era and we see the invasive activities of the FBI at that time. And then we look today with technology, the broad reach of surveillance in our country, that risk is even greater now. But the ultimate cost of this new Cold War and nuclear arms race is where it will inevitably end. Nuclear war between the US, Russia, and or China. It'll cost us trillions of dollars. And in this arms race that's already been escalated by this president doing things like withdrawing from the INF Treaty, everyone loses. This arms race can go on for decades but there is an inevitable outcome, and that outcome is a nuclear war, a war that no one can win, a war where everyone loses. Many strategists believe that we are at a greater risk of nuclear war now than at any time in history. The threat of nuclear war and the new Cold War is every bit a domestic issue as it is a foreign policy issue because it has to do with our very existence. And we have to understand that a World War III would be a nuclear war and there would be no winner because it would destroy the world. It's, it's hard to imagine what this looks like. It seems like something that could be far away, but in fact the threat is very real today. And we in Hawaii got a pretty big wake-up call to this about a year ago. In January of last year, there was a text alert sent out by our state civil defense that went across over a million phones all across our state that was blasted in, on the radio and on the news saying, missile incoming, seek shelter immediately. This is not a drill. Just ask you to imagine for a minute how you would feel in getting that message, knowing you would have just minutes to live, thinking about where are your loved ones, where can shelter be found, seek shelter immediately, where do you go, where can you go to be protected from a nuclear missile that is incoming. That's what went through our minds and it was terrifying. It was terrifying. We had uh, a father who lowered his, his little seven-year-old girl down a manhole, thinking that that may be the only place she could be safe. I'm recording an iPhone video saying, if you see this, I'm probably gone, but this is where my daughter is. We had another who was in the middle of the island of Oahu, he had one child on one side of the island and another on the other side of the island. And he sat there for just a moment trying to figure out which of his children he would spend the last minutes of his life with. How do you make that choice? It was absolutely terrifying going through this understanding that we would have just minutes to live. And while that alarm turned out to be false, we reacted the way that we did because this threat is real. This threat is real. There is no shelter. There is no safety. There is no protection. And the impacts of this, the impacts of this are hard to conceive of. 
We look back to when those bombs were dropped on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. While many families were having breakfast, early in the morning, getting ready for work, 245,000 people were killed instantly. Many others died from the bombing, injuries and radiation, bringing the total body count to more than 400,000. We saw the impacts of the shockwave alone completely decimating entire buildings just from the change in the air pressure. Horrible atrocities for those who somehow survived. Between 1950 and 2000, survivors of those atomic bombs in Japan were 46% more likely than the general population to develop lethal cases of leukemia. What to speak of the nuclear winter that occurs, where much of our planet turn, would turn to radioactive ash, where our soil and water would be contaminated for decades, making it impossible for even those who manage to survive to grow food or find uncontaminated water to drink. So the idea that some in, in our government now are propagating that one could win a nuclear war is false. We have some leaders in the Pentagon and foreign policy experts saying, sure, the United States can still fight and win two major wars with Russia and China at the same time. Others saying, a former advisor of Dick Cheney recently said, basically that a war could take place in Europe where American forces currently are. They're going to be fighting on the borders of Russia, not on the Atlantic seaboard of the United States, thinking that somehow this nuclear conflict could be contained and that we would be just fine here at home. And then you have President Trump making statements like he did last year, saying that in times of war and conflict, you can blow up windmills, they'll fall down real quick. You can blow up pipelines. You can do a lot of things to solar panels, but you know what? You can't hurt coal. Thinking that somehow our biggest concern in a nuclear war is going to be windmills being blown up so out of touch with the reality that we face, so out of touch with the seriousness and the cost of the threat that we face. The insanity and the madness, the inhumanity of thinking that somehow this war is something we can contemplate doing or something that we can contemplate winning is impossible to overstate. The reality is that in event of such a war, you would have the elite and a few of the most powerful tucked away in hidden bunkers somewhere while the rest of us are forgotten about because we don't matter or we don't count. For, for so-called leaders to believe that we could be victorious in such a war because we killed a few hundred million more of their people than they did of ours can only be described as insane. So we talked about how such a war could come about intentionally because of the increasing tensions that we have. But there is just as great a risk of a war being started by accident. And we have a number of examples from the past of near misses, of these accidents. In 1983, the Soviet Union shot down a Korean Airlines, a flight that was carrying a US congressman. Tensions were very high at that time. That same month, the Soviet missile commander received a warning of an imminent nuclear attack by the United States. His standing orders were to launch a nuclear counterstrike. But this commander, a colonel, with the world in his hands, he saved the world by hesitating, by not launching that attack, even though he was ordered to do so until it was learned that this imminent attack was actually a false alarm triggered by sunlight reflecting off clouds. 
A similar incident occurred in 1995 with Russian President Yeltsin almost starting a nuclear war after a weather satellite launch from Norway was mistaken for an incoming missile attack. Now Yeltsin had actually opened Russia's version of the nuclear football at that time, was prepared to launch a counterattack when he hesitated for just long enough to confirm that it was a false alarm. There are a number of other examples that we can cite about how close and how easy it would be even to launch a nuclear war on accident. And when we look at how often today computer malfunctions are common, we see how much more complicated this threat becomes. So as tensions continue to increase, as we find ourselves in the place that we are, the prospect of nuclear war is not a question of if it will happen, it's a question of when if we continue down this path. Just as important as it is for us to recognize the reality of this threat, we also therefore then must recognize that it doesn't have to be this way. It doesn't have to be this way. That's why I'm running for president. To bring about an end to these regime change wars, this new Cold War and nuclear arms race, and take the resources that we've wasted on war and use them for our people here at home. To lead this country forward with a foreign policy that's focused on de-escalating tensions rather than ratcheting up this new Cold War and nuclear arms race to work towards drawing down our military expenditures, not increasing them, to create a path forward where we can live in peace with other countries and work in cooperation rather than conflict, and to get rid of the fossilized zero-sum mentality of our foreign policy establishment where they believe that in order for us, our country, the American people to win, everyone else must fail. Instead, we must build relationships based on this win-win approach, remembering always that there is no winner in a nuclear war and that we live on this planet together. And wherever possible, we have to take advantage of the opportunity to work together to make sure that we have a safe and prosperous future for everyone. Now, it's important to understand that when I say that we need to stop trying to be the world's police and that we need to end our regime change policies, that does not mean we're isolationists or that we should not be involved internationally in our global community. Our country remains the most powerful and influential country in the world. We cannot isolate ourselves. We can and we must lead the world into more cooperation towards peace. We must be the leader that the world desperately needs right now to ensure the survival of the human race. It is our responsibility as the most powerful and influential country in the world to wield that power, to be a force for good, to save the world from the calamity of a nuclear war that we are sleepwalking towards. It must be our mission to ensure that the 21st century will forever be known as the turning point in human history, that era in which the world's great powers chose to abandon the path to confrontation and war and agreed to pursue the path of cooperation, diplomacy, and peace. Now, some may ask, how is it possible to have a positive relationship with countries like Russia and China? After the fall of the Soviet Union, our country had a very positive relationship with Russia. That was not that long ago. We have to go back to a place where we recognize how important it is that we build these cooperative relationships. Because if we don't, it is our country that is undermined. It is our economy that's undermined, our security that's undermined, our environment and our future that is undermined. So when you understand that, you understand that we really don't have a choice. Whether we like it or not, our fates as human beings in this world are tied together. And the issues that we face, pollution of our air, our waters, oceans, 
the climate crisis that's before us, the spread of disease, the existential threat of nuclear war. These are all issues that require us to sit down, to talk, and to work together. Whether it be with friends or with people who are adversaries or potential adversaries. If we in the United States do all that we can right now, for example, to address climate change, it will still not be enough. We cannot solve these problems alone. We have to work together. We have to work together to make sure that our kids today and for generations to come can not only survive, but thrive and prosper without fear of being obliterated by nuclear bombs, without fear of toxic and poisonous water, or polluted air, or not enough food to eat. So as president, I would immediately arrange for one-on-one -on -one meetings with the other nuclear powers in the world and work to reaffirm the declaration made by President Reagan and then General Secretary Gorbachev that a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. I would work to bring together leaders of the world to agree upon our existential need to end the new Cold War, to stop the dangerous and wasteful arms race, and negotiate a path forward to eventually rid the world of nuclear weapons. As president, I will lead this country to bring about a bold change in our foreign policy that bends the arc of history away from war and towards peace, that stops wasting our resources and our lives on regime change wars and redirects our focus and energy toward the pursuit of cooperation and peace and prosperity for all people. The time is now to give up the gunboat diplomacy of the past and instead work out our differences with communication and negotiations and goodwill. Because imagine how much we can accomplish. Imagine how much we could accomplish, how many people we could help lift up out of poverty, how we can transition away from fossil fuels and towards a 100% renewable energy economy, how we can ensure healthcare for all, how we can make sure we're providing a quality education, how we can end the homeless crisis that we face, how we can rebuild our crumbling infrastructure. Imagine how much we could accomplish if we stopped wasting money on regime change wars, this new Cold War and nuclear arms race, and instead used our collective and limited resources to actually help people. So I'm running for president to lead our country toward that peaceful and prosperous future. <coughs> to put people ahead of profits. To put people ahead of politics. To bring the values that are at the heart of every soldier, every service member, those values of service above self to the White House. To restore those principles of integrity and honor and respect to the presidency. Thank you very much. Aloha. Thank you so much for uh, giving us so much to think over. Uh, I've got uh, certainly enough questions to fill the rest of the evening, uh, much more time than you have and most of the people here as well. Uh, but since I'm seeing such an engaged crowd, uh, including a number of my students, who naturally comprise a certain elite in this university, uh, I want to If you may say so yourself. <laughs> I'm so impressed with them, with all of you. Uh, I, want to, I want to allow more time for the uh, questioners uh, to bring up what's on their mind. But let me just start out by asking you this question. Uh, you devoted most of your speech to policy issues, and I'm sure that's what most of the people in the audience want to hear. Uh, but I can't help but ask you one question that relates policy to politics. Uh, 
I'm going to cite two facts to you, and I'd like you to ask, to tell me if you think there's a connection between these two facts. Fact number one is that your critique of American foreign policy is quite profound. You are not nibbling around the edges. You are looking for a complete redirection of the security policies of this country and the way the United States faces the world. That's fact number one. Fact number two is that when I look in the press and start reading about what presidential candidates said yesterday, what presidential candidates are doing, what they're thinking, what they're working on, what they're focusing on, oftentimes I find you way at the bottom or you're not even in the article. Do you think there's a connection between those two facts? Unfortunately, yes. I think your audience is pretty well in tune with, uh, with, with that answer. And it's unfortunate. This is the unfortunate reality that we're facing where uh, it is not only those in the foreign policy establishment, it is not only those in the military industrial complex, but it is also many in the media who uh, continue to uh, perpetuate these same failed policies and who seek to uh, squash the voices of those of us who are challenging, challenging the status quo with the truth and the consequences of many, many decades of these continued regime change war policies. But what gives me hope about our ability to bring about this change is that both in, in places that I go across the country, living rooms where we're having conversations like the one we're having here today, uh, in small towns, big cities, and in different parts of the country, people from all different political parties, they understand very well what has gone wrong with our foreign policy and who has paid the price and stand together and saying, this has got to stop now. And so even as I'm talking with folks who, who disagree with me on other issues, they believe so strongly about the urgent need for us to do what I'm talking about, to end regime change wars, to end, work to end this new Cold War and nuclear arms race, that they want to stand knowing that it is only our voices, we the people standing up, that can overcome the obstacles to bring about this kind of big change we're talking about. I do sense that there is a constituency out there in America for a different approach to the world. However, that constituency has never had the political or intellectual leadership that will allow it to punch its weight in Washington. And I'm thinking that maybe your campaign is going to be one way we can try to congeal that leadership. Yes. <laughs> That's the yes. answer I wanted. Uh, I think I've used up my half hour, and uh, I would really like, uh, Vivek, would you like to come up and, and uh, call on people and try to help run this? Uh, Vivek Pandit was one of the people responsible for this event, so I'd like to ask him to take over. Thank you. Thank you all. I'm going to leave you Can you hear me? Cool. So I'm going to actually start off with the first question, and then we have um, a second question that's going to be asked. Um, about the environment, and if you're here, someone from the Sunrise Movement, I believe you can, okay, cool. So you can ask the second question, and then we'll open it up. Um, after he asks his question, you guys can get to Mike, so we'll go back and forth, and we'll try to do this quick so we can get as many in as possible. Um, but first of all, thank you, Professor, for moderating, and thank you, Congresswoman, for coming, and thank you guys all for listening. Uh, I want to start off by asking you, so we talked a lot about, you know, your experiences as a veteran and how that shaped your viewpoints on understanding the cost of war. Um, and I want to ask more specifically, how has your experience as a female veteran impacted your experiences and identity and maybe shaped your decision to run for president? Um, thank you. You know, there's, there's a, lot, um, a lot of things that come to mind. Uh, in, in Washington, both Tammy Duckworth and I were elected to Congress in the same year in 2012, and we were the first two female combat veterans ever elected to the United States Congress. And both of us uh, got seats on the Armed Services Committee. And there were a few things happening uh, at that time that made this really impactful and made it possible for us to really be the voices for so many people whose voices hadn't been heard before. 
One was the lifting, at that time, Secretary Panetta, right before he left as the Secretary of Defense, he uh, lifted the policy that banned women from serving in combat roles in the military. It's a pretty huge change in our, our country's, in our military history. Uh, now for, there, uh, there may be some, some female veterans here. For those of us who've served, we know that women have actually been serving in combat roles for quite some time. Uh, maybe just not getting credit for it or being recognized, but women have been getting the job done in the military for a long time. It was interesting being on the Armed Services Committee when that policy decision was made and continuing to hear the outdated uh, views by many of our colleagues who had no idea about what it meant for a woman to serve in the military. So our voices were incredibly important at that time. Right around that time as well, the exposure of the high numbers of sexual assault in the military came to the forefront. And once again, there was a lot of misinformation that was being put out. Uh, serving on that committee, speaking up for survivors of sexual assault in the military to try to bring about the kind of change that would ensure a transparent uh, and fair path towards justice for them uh, was, was critical. It wasn't something that I really expected when I first ran for Congress, but it proved to be critical. Unfortunately, this is a battle that we're continuing to fight today as women, both men and women in the military who are uh, victims of sexual assault are still subject to uh, the possibility of retaliation from within the chain of command or decisions being made to sweep their, um, their assault under the table. Uh, do we have, how many veterans do we have here? You just raise your hand. All right, we've, we've got a few. Thank you for your service. One thing that, that I found as we were going through all of this was I, I served for four years as an enlisted soldier first before I went through officer candidate school and earned my commission. And I'm grateful to have had that experience to see and to have, to have experienced both sides. And for those who are here who've been enlisted versus those who've been an officer, they're very different experiences. Two different roles, two different jobs. And one thing I found as we were going through um, this discussion and debate about how to deal with the sexual assault happening in the military is oftentimes it was the officers or the commanders who were coming in and saying, well, we have to protect the command, whereas the vast majority of people who were victims of sexual assault were enlisted. And they were the ones I, I heard, I met a woman who shared her story about how, and I won't get into the gory details, but she was uh, assaulted a number of times. She had pictures on a cell phone that she was able to take. She went and reported to her first sergeant what had been happening. And the first sergeant's response was, he would never do that. He's such a great soldier. He's top notch. I don't believe you. This is a female first sergeant. Then she brought in the pictures. She said, you don't believe me? Here's my evidence. The first sergeant was disturbed and she said, okay. Well, here, give me the memory card from your phone so that I can share this with the commander and so that we can make sure that, that you're able to, to get justice and accountability for what he's done. Can you guess what happened? <laughs> Nothing. She went back and kept asking and kept asking and, oh, well, we can't find the memory card anymore. It disappeared. There are so many people with stories like this. I'm, I'm, I've taken this in a little bit of a different direction, Vivek, but it speaks to uh, the challenge that, still, that we still have before us. I've introduced legislation uh, at that time called the Military Justice Improvement Act, which would do that, which would provide an avenue um, that is independent of that direct chain of command to make sure that those who are seeking justice are able to get it. Thank you. All right. And then if you want to come to this mic, you can ask. Um, and then if you guys want to ask questions, uh, you guys can walk up to the mics. Oh, I know it's gonna be a frenzy. All right, there we go. There we go. 
<laughs> Every time. <laughs> All right. So. Hi, my name is Ella, and I'm an organizer with the Sunrise Movement. I also grew up in South Kona in your district. Awesome. Um, I'm, I'm noticing your sweatshirt. Yes. <laughs> Represent. Yes. Um, so I was excited to hear about your support for the Select Committee on a Green New Deal and um, appreciated your speech at the press conference with Rokana. And, but then now that there is a resolution on the table, you've refused to support it. Um, and we appreciate your bold leadership with the Off Fossil Fuels Act, which is very necessary. But we need you to co-sponsor the Green New Deal so that you can be part of the po process going forward and incorporate everything you talked about today into that policy. Um, so I'm asking you today um, if you'll join nearly all of the Democratic presidential contenders and nearly half of the Democratic caucus in co-sponsoring the resolution for a Green New Deal. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Um, I, I appreciate and have met with and worked with uh, many of the leaders from the Sunrise Movement uh, in Washington as well as in Hawaii and appreciate so much the work that you're doing to raise this issue uh, to the forefront. Uh, as you mentioned, I've introduced the Off Fossil Fuels Act. We're strengthening it and improving it now. We'll be reintroducing it in Congress. Legislation that provides an actionable plan and pathway to get us off of fossil fuels and invest in that green renewable energy economy that I talked about. Invest in that trained workforce. Invest in our future. I have some concerns with the Green New Deal, which is why the resolution, which is why I haven't signed on to it, uh, a major concern is the fact that nuclear power is not uh, mentioned in the resolution as uh, a, an option that we will not consider. Um, I was just in San Onofre in California uh, a little over a week ago where I went and visited with young leaders, surfers, environmentalists, some of whom you may know who are active with the Sunrise Movement, uh, and we went out and surfed at their local spot, which is right in front of the San Onofre nuclear power plant. A power plant that has stopped functioning since 2012, but a place where they're continuing to store huge amounts of nuclear waste. Right there, as we were out in the water, we looked up right there on the bluff, overlooking the beach, we saw many canisters of nuclear waste. Waste that threatens that community, threatens that beach, threatens that ocean, and waste which is also sitting on an earthquake fault line. And so the question there that they were asking was, and the community is saying, hey, we got to get rid of this stuff. Waste that sticks around for 500,000 years, where do they go? So one of the solutions they're putting forward is let's put it in a temporary storage facility in New Mexico or Texas because there is no permanent repository to store safely the nuclear waste we've created in this country, nuclear waste which is threatening our environment, threatening our communities. So instead they're saying, let's put these temporary facilities in New Mexico or Texas. Well, there was an indigenous leader from New Mexico who flew out to California so that she could meet with me and tell me how important it was that their community on their tribal lands not be burdened with this nuclear waste. They don't want to keep shoving it off into someone else's yard. And there's a growing um, movement of, of national voices who are saying that we're not going to shove this problem in someone else's yard. So this is, to me, a serious issue that we have to include. That's in my Off Fossil Fuels Act to make sure that we don't continue to make the wrong kinds of investments that actually end up causing more harm and more of a threat to our environment uh, than not. So I look forward to continuing to work with the Sunrise Movement as we all work towards the goal I think that we're seeking to accomplish which is to get off of fossil fuels and create that 100% green renewable energy economy, taking care of our people, taking care of our planet, and ensuring that we have a prosperous future for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Lionel. I'm from URI, actually. And I was wondering, if you were elected president, would you remove the trade embargo from Cuba, and would you also remove sanctions from the government of Venezuelan leader Nicolas Maduro? Uh, yes, I would lift that trade embargo. Those, the actions that we saw the Obama administration take uh, with Cuba uh, 
we saw a huge amount of progress in a short period of time. Uh, it's, it's very disheartening to see how this Trump administration has reversed that progress that was made under the Obama administration and is now making things even worse. I think there was a recent announcement that they're not only implementing sanctions and other restrictions on the Cuban government and the ability for visitors to go in, but also restricting the remittances that Americans can send to their relatives in Cuba to $1,000 every three months. So we're hearing from people in Cuba wondering about how they'll survive. This is really impacting the Cuban people most negatively. We are seeing the implementation of sanctions in Venezuela as yet another avenue to effect regime change with the consequence of having a negative impact on the people of Venezuela, the very people that this administration claims to want to help. We've got to keep our hands off of Venezuela. It's a difficult situation right now. The, Venezuela, the Venezuelan people have to be the ones to determine their own future. Namaste. Namaste. My name's Charlie, and um, I agree with everything you've said, but I'm more motivated by an ideal than I am by what I'm afraid of. How would you address many people who are not willing to look at the fears and who were looking for an ideal? I think I talked about those ideals, those mm -hmm. values and those principles that we need to bring to the forefront of this country. Right. Not because we're motivated by fear, but because we want to, to serve. Mm -hmm. We want to take care of each other. We want to make sure that we've got a peaceful and prosperous future. And so long as we have leaders in this country who are more interested in putting their own selfish interests ahead of the interests of the people, who are more interested in corporate profits, even when that means that it's contaminating and poisoning and polluting our environment and our planet and threatening our future, then we, the people, lose every single time. That's why I talk about how important it is that we place these values of service above self at the forefront, that we are able to fulfill that vision that the founders had for us of truly having a representative government for the people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your talk, Congresswoman. Thank so, you. So, uh, my name is Aditya, and I'm from Delhi. And I had two connected questions, actually, related to the argument of, like, a third war related to nuclear energy and all of that. So, my first question is with Iran. So, just this morning, the State Department announced that they will be that they will not renew the waivers given to certain countries importing Iranian oil, and that includes India, Pakistan, and China. And so what would your policy be towards Iran? How would you revert back to the deal made by the Obama administration? Or what is your plan on that front? And my second question is, you said that you'd have individual meetings with all the leaders of nuclear powers and try to de-escalate. So just looking at the situation of India, where we're facing a hostile neighbor in Pakistan and in China, and five countries, the five Security Me Council members, are part of the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty, and India and China, uh, India and Pakistan, sorry, are not. And they're not going to be as willing to denuclearize. What would you do about that, and how would you go about denuclearizing in such difficult environments? Thank you. Very important questions. Uh, to your first question, the, the Iran nuclear deal was far from perfect, but it was very important. Uh, and the fact that it was accomplished and passed by Congress, I voted for it, was a huge step forward towards peace and away from war. The actions taken by this administration to withdraw from that nuclear deal, even though our own intelligence agencies and intelligence agencies from all these other countries who are signatories confirmed, they remained in compliance, has made our country less safe, has made it less likely that countries like North Korea or other countries will pursue denuclearization. So yes, as president, I would re-enter the Iran nuclear deal and look at parallel tracks to see how we can continue to try to strengthen it. The move made by the Trump administration this morning uh, to get rid of those sanction waivers is a dangerous one that will further isolate our country uh, that will further ruin the relationships with other countries that actually are within our best interest. 
Uh, and we'll see those relationships that, where there's great opportunity for mutual benefit, for shared interests. We'll see those countries continue to look elsewhere, to look for relationships with, uh, with other countries, to look in other places uh, as um, the United States continues to punish them in its pursuit of war with Iran. It's a very dangerous path that they've chosen. Uh, look, the answer to your second question is not an easy one. I don't, I don't claim, t I don't make any claims that, you know, well, we're just gonna have a meeting and then uh, that'll be it. We'll be able to accomplish what we're trying to accomplish. It is a huge task. It is a huge task before us, but it has to begin with building a relationship of being willing to sit down and talk. And unfortunately, right now, we're not seeing that with many of the countries that you raised. This conversation is not even willing to be had. Instead, we're seeing ever-increasing tensions occurring. There are a lot of other differences and issues and concerns that we'll need to address to get to that point of denuclearization, but we have to be willing to begin that conversation and do the hard work that's necessary to reach that goal. You know, when Reagan and Gorbachev negotiated the INF Treaty, there were many leaders in many countries, many naysayers in Washington who said it would be impossible. It was an impossible thing. But they had not one, not two, but they had many conversations that ultimately led them to this place of recognizing it was in the mutual interests of both of their people and their countries. Mm -hmm. And they did what had to be done. They did what was right, yes. making the world and, and our mutual countries more safe. True. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so Uh, good evening. You've described yourself as a uh, war hawk when it comes to the war on terror. In this vein, you've expressed support for the Kurds' fight against ISIS, but have been criticized for a perceived tolerance of the violence of the Assad regime after meeting face-to-face -face with the brutal dictator. My question is, um, when you say America should, let, quote unquote, let the Syrian people decide their future, how is it that you expect Syrians to be this change when bombs rain down on their heads and millions uh, flee from their homes? And this is coming from a place of concern because you want, it's not simply to say, oh, Tulsi Gabbard um, loves Assad, um, but it's a, it's a place of concern because you want to be president and you, if, if that is indeed what happens, um, you will be in, you will have, a very real impact on the lives of millions of Syrians, some of whom are in this room. So I wanted to know, how, like, how, how do you follow along? Like, like, how can you, where does your justification of that statement come from? Like, what will you do? Thank you. Thank you for your question. And I want to complete uh, the, the quote that you mentioned in the beginning of your question. Yes, I'm very hawkish when it comes to the fight against terrorist groups like ISIS and Al Qaeda. And I am a dove when it comes to regime change wars. Uh, and that's the position that I've taken with Syria uh, throughout my years in Congress, even before I had a chance to go in and visit Syria, a chance to go in and visit and hear from the people who are being directly impacted by our policies in this country. My position comes from the fact that time and time again in this country, over and over again, when we wage regime change wars, the result on the people in those countries is more suffering it's more death, it's more destruction. It's heartbreaking to see the suffering of the Syrian people. It's heartbreaking to see the suffering of people in countries who are led by dictators, who are causing that suffering. But we have to be real about the world that we live in because this is the reality that we face. We, have, we don't live in the world that we wanna live in, we have what we have. And so whether we're talking about Iraq or Libya or the many other examples in the past, in Syria, the fact is that if the United States is successful in toppling the Assad regime, as we see happens in other countries, the most powerful force on the ground takes over, fills that leadership position. And in Syria, the result of that is the most powerful force over all of these years has continued to be these terrorist groups. And they've gone by different names. There's Al-Qaeda, um, THS, a uh, number of different names. ISIS obviously was there, they're largely been defeated now. But the result of a terrorist group like Al Qaeda taking over is we would see a decimation and destruction of religious minorities across Syria. That's a fact. I visited a number of those churches 
I met with a number of religious leaders from many different denominations who spoke in no uncertain terms. And some of them were supportive of the Assad government, others were strongly opposed, but they were very clear-eyed about what would happen. So yes, it is up to the Syrian people to determine what kinds of reforms and changes they wanted to see in their future. I met with leaders of some of the protests that were held early on, 2011 and 2012. People who remain strongly opposed to the government in Syria, who remain deeply rooted in their conviction of the kinds of changes they want to see. But even they said, we don't want the United States, France, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, or Turkey, or any other country coming in and telling us what to do with our country and our future and who should lead our country. There are bad people in the world, and there are people who are suffering. The United States coming in and acting as the world's police to go in and topple dictators that we don't like unfortunately, doesn't solve the problem. It has proven time and again to increase that suffering, to increase those refugees who are forced to flee their homes. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for coming. My question's about climate change as it relates to foreign policy, and it's a bit lengthy, so I apologize, but I think it's an important point to get to. Um, so as you know, at 1.5 degrees Celsius warming above pre-industrial levels, the climate will reach a point of no return and we will be in climate disaster. It's essential to understand that this disaster is not just that our climate will be warmer, species will go extinct, and sea levels will rise, although each of these is horrible on their own. It is so much more than this. Migration on a scale we have never seen before will overwhelm every country in this world or leave millions stranded. Unbelievable suffering will be placed on vulnerable communities who will not be able to feed or house themselves. They will die. The basic structures of our societies will be uprooted. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has essentially given two technical solutions to this problem. These solutions either have us reaching 1.5 degrees Celsius and maxing out there, which is a disaster situation, or overshooting that level and then sucking carbon out of the air to, reach, to get back to that 1.5 degrees Celsius, another disaster situation. Right now, the Paris Climate Accord, which was seen as a massive breakthrough in global cooperation, as well as a pie-in-the-sky policy that was like, unlikely to get implemented, would only reduce one-third of emissions necessary to reach this goal. Oftentimes, the, problem, the magnitude of this problem seems intangible and therefore is not addressed properly. So I'll be very blunt. Governments across the world will collapse. Economies across the world will collapse. Climate change is like a wrecking ball swinging towards every single institution in this world that we rely upon. And it will not stop by us choosing to ignore it or give half-hearted responses about how we need to work together. So I want to be very clear on my question. I'm not asking you to support any current policy proposal. However, I want to know how you plan to deal with this issue on the scale of the problem, and I would ask that you offer specifics rather than simply talk about how important the issue is. Thank you. Specifically, a lot of time. Okay, my, this is my question. How do you plan to deal with the suffering that would be imposed on communities across the world? Thank you. Thank you for speaking in great detail about the seriousness of the threat uh, that we face. There are a number of very specific actions that we need to take in this country. There are two uh, major ones. One is one I've talked about, about the need to get our country off of fossil fuels and to make the kinds of bold investments that we need to make in a green renewable energy economy, in a green renewable energy workforce, in a green renewable energy infrastructure, looking at our buildings, looking at our everyday lives and seeing what kind of impact we are having and making those kinds of changes that we need to make. Another huge area that has to be addressed is our agriculture industry and the contributions that that is making in a huge, at a huge scale of emitting more carbon into our atmosphere, of worsening the climate crisis that we're facing. This is one that requires on both fronts where we're taking on huge, uh, well-funded corporate interests, whether it be the corporate interests of big oil or the corporate interests of multinational agriculture corporations who benefit off of these practices that are threatening our environment. 
that are increasing this threat of climate change. So we have to make, we have to take these challenges head on here. This is gonna require not only leaders in Washington recognizing how urgent this crisis is, but it's gonna take the will of the American people to bring about these changes, which is gonna require information, conversation, discussion. A lot of the work that we're starting to see happen more and more across communities as people of all ages are getting involved in recognizing this is our very future that's at stake. We have to deal with the influence of big money, special interest money, PAC contributions, influence of lobbyists in Washington. And the fact that today we are still dishing out almost $30 billion every year in subsidies to big oil companies. We are dishing out huge subsidies to these multinational agribusiness corporations. How is that possible? As we talk about all the other needs that we have, we're still giving our taxpayer dollars to these interests. We're actually having a detrimental impact on our environment and our future. So we have to tackle that, the influence of big money in our politics. We have to do what's necessary here at home. We also have to re-enter these agreements with other countries. We have to proactively seek out and build those relationships to see how do we tackle these challenges together. Our world is, in, is, is getting smaller and smaller, and the decisions that we make, the decisions that these other countries make, impact us all. We can't do that so long as our foreign policy continues to be one that's focused on conflict, that continues to be one that is uh, uh, this, this win-lose mentality. We have to recognize our interconnectedness and work together to address this threat or face the disastrous consequences. Last one. Um, Congresswoman, I wanted to thank you. Um, first of all, as a young woman and as a service member, um, growing up, I didn't have any female role models in the service, and it was largely your career that inspired me to join the National Guard. So it's an honor to have you here at my alma mater. Um, but my question for you is, as a presidential candidate, um, you become president, what does the future for transgendered service members look like in America? Thank you for asking uh, this important question. When did you end up joining the National Guard? I joined a little over two years ago, and I'll be completing OCS in three months. Awesome. Um, thank you for your service. Thank you for making that choice. Uh, and thanks for asking this important question. Um, look, very simply put, for those of us who serve, this is very personal. Because I've been in for 16 years now. On those two deployments, I serve with LGBTQ soldiers and service members people who I trained with, people who I deployed with, people who I entrusted my life with. I know that they would have my back, they would give their life for me just as I would for them. Very few people in this country make the choice that you made of raising your right hand and being willing to give your life, to give your life in service to this country. That must be honored and respected. So I would lift that trans ban in our military as president and commander in chief. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Congresswoman Thank you.